Hi, I'm TJ Ware, and on this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be taking a look at bloat and bloatware, right after this. So I think we've all probably seen bloat and bloatware sometime during the uh, during our journey with computers, whether that be from installing an operating system or bringing home a new laptop that had software on it that we really didn't want or even know why it got there. So I thought it would be good to take a step back for a minute before we actually define what the, those two things are and talk about it from the standpoint of what some of the industry's leaders uh, thought about it. So Nicholas Wirth, who was the, uh, he was the creator of Pascal, created Worth's Law, and he said that software speed is decreasing more rapidly than hardware speed is increasing. And that had to do with the same problems that, that he saw back then, this had been in the 70s and early 80s, that uh, feature sets were just climbing at a rate that was alarming. Jamie Zawinski, who was a, 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 a developer for Mozilla, said that every program expands until it can read email. No, yeah, he meant that as a joke, but uh, <laughs> Google is definitely there. They're definitely doing it. Uh, Edsker Dijkstra, who was a Burroughs Fellow and also a, uh, a professor in computer science, said that simplicity is a great virtue, but it requires hard work to achieve and an education to appreciate it. And to make matters worse, complexity sells better. And that's so true. I don't know how many times during my career I saw two applications that had exactly the same features or very close. And the, and the users would always pick the more complex one. They would always pick the one that was harder to learn, harder to use, and took more steps to get anything done than the one that was just simpler and more intuitive to work with. Never really understood that. Is that it has to, uh, human nature must equate complexity with, with a better set of software when in actuality is just the opposite. Simplicity is better software. So in bloat, uh, there's two forms of bloat. First, uh, the software bloat, it, that's the kind that occurs over time and that has to do with adding features and taking some away or forgetting about them and not taking them off the menu but just leaving the code there. And the reason for that is you have, over time, you have a lot of different applications developers that are working on it. They may not understand what that code does and they're not <laughs> gonna go in there and touch it and then have to end up being responsible for fixing it because it broke something else in the code. But it slows the, the software down. It, let, it makes the software take more memory and it increases its vulnerabilities to uh, to uh, 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 to attack, and so the attack surface grows larger when those kinds of things occur. Bloatware refers to software, of course, that's pre-installed by the operating system or by the vendor, stuff we don't want, but it also refers to software that's been deinstalled and it leaves behind stuff. I think we've all seen where uh, we've been deinstalled some software on Windows. Those of us that came out of the Windows background have seen this where it left DLLs all over the place. Or uh, even in the Linux world, it happens when I deinstall a package, but because of dependencies uh, within that package that leaves behind libraries or other pieces of code that uh, you don't really want to leave behind. So that's the other kind of bloatware. We've all seen, uh, we have seen uh, Windows and Mac. I'll pick on them for a minute. Uh, I've seen them grow on their resource counts over time. Uh, uh, Windows started out with four megabytes of memory requirements and 50 megabytes of disk, and they say uh, <laughs> one gigabyte of memory and 16 gigabyte of disk. I find that really hard to believe. Uh, and I would challenge you to actually put that under a VM and try that and see what happens. See if they really can use it. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe Yonky Joe can. But, uh, uh, on the uh, Mac side of things, we got uh, two gig of memory for the requirement and eight gig of hard disk. When it started out with, uh, well, this is back as far as Mavericks. There was a lot more OS 10s before that. Um, and then Mojave, the, the latest one, requires 12.8 gig, and they say two gig of memory. Again, I really, really don't believe that either. 
Uh, it did decline a little bit from High Sierra on the disk requirements, and I have to think that that's because Apple removed some pieces of software, much to the uh, chagrin of us, of those of us who use it with uh, Linux, because they took out some support for some of the things that we use. Um, and also because of the Apple file system has a, uh, uh, it is a, a copy on write and it also re removes duplicate uh, duplication within the file system. We estimate Windows to contain about 50 million lines of code and uh, there was a, a, a formal study done back in 2015 where they actually did a slot count on, I think it was Windows 10. And it was somewhat less than 50 million, but we think it's around 50 million now. Not quite sure. Nobody knows except Microsoft. Um, the Mac OS, they used to have an open source uh, community for Darwin, and uh, that included the open source parts. Uh, of course, Apple came out of uh, both the BSD, the Next Step, and also uh, uh, NetBSD as their uh, baselines and then the mock kernel which of course was also open source and then they added their flavors of software on top of it but we think since that's gone we don't know we can't really get a, a good answer on how many uh, lines of source code they actually have but we think it's somewhere around 90 million uh, plus or minus whatever uh, they think it's it will fit in two gig of memory I haven't seen a Mac run in less than 8 gig on the, any of their present OS's unless you go in and turn off every service you can find and then keep the ones that keep popping back up from coming. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, that would be a challenge to get one to run in 2 gig of memory. And then there's Google. Um, this would be all their internet services. This would be their browser, their the Gmail, their calendar, their docs, all of the things that are in their uh, inter internet services portfolio. It does not include things like Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is growing at an exponential rate already because they, they just keep dumping features into that. But it's around 2 billion plus lines of code right now, and... Uh, <laughs> I just can't imagine how many person years Google has invested in developing all that. Uh, incredible attack surface, uh, surface uh, just a phenomenal attack surface. Uh, as far as Linux is concerned, I took, I downloaded the uh, latest mainline kernel yesterday, which was version 5.3, release candidate 5, and then I ran slot count against it, that software by Dave, uh, uh, Wheeler, uh, 2.26, I think it was. And I came up with about 18.2 million lines of code. Uh, but you have to realize that it's not shown on here. I should have. Uh, uh, but the it's the 12.1.2, million lines of code is in the driver's directory. So uh, most of that, that software code is in the support of hardware. So, yeah, besides that, does that really tell us anything about the bloat in, in Linux? Not really. And the reason is, is that when you compile a Linux kernel, you choose what features you want to include in that kernel compile. And you can include some of them as part of the baseline install. That is, it's all part of the uh, system land uh, uh, space. Or you can include them as modules, which get... And it, which get included in the kernel when the system is booted up, optionally, if you turn them on. And then you can say, I don't want those features at all, and just don't include them in the compile at all. So you use menu config to do that. The uh, This isn't the current count on 5.3. I, I didn't run uh, a check to see uh, how, many, uh, how many features were in that config file, but the last time I ran menu config, it was 6,186 features, and that was with version 5.0 of the uh, Linux kernel. On top of that, each Linux distro makes their own decisions and selections from the list of those features. So Debian is, might be a little different from Ubuntu. Ubuntu is going to be a lot different from Fedora, for example. Um, SUSE is going to have its own set. Arch is going to have its own set as well. So. There was uh, some discussion between, this was in two, 2013, between one of the Red Hat developers 
and Linus Torvalis. And, and the Red Hat developer was asking Linus about removing some obsolete pieces of code that were in the, uh, the, in the uh, kernel baseline. And Linus replied, well, he said, you know, basically this has been a real uh, source of frustration <laughs> and, and a pet peeve of his where he said, many of the supported infrastructure questions are very opaque. I have no idea which of them any particular distribution actually depends on. He doesn't get information from the distributions about what particular features they're using in the kernel until they try to remove them and then they release the, uh, the uh, release candidate and the, the, the distros guys go, whoa, wait a minute, we were using that. So that's a source of frustration and I can understand that. Uh, I, and so I understand a little bit about some of his reasoning for not just going in and wholesale ripping stuff out. Uh, so if you want a smaller Linux kernel, then the best thing to do is just compile one yourself. But you're going to need a config file. And so where do you find that? Well, on most distributions, they include it. Now, there are some. I have run into some that they don't provide a config file. Raspberry Pis are one of those. But for ARMS and x86 and Ubuntu and Fedora, I have found it pretty easily. Uh, usually they're in two places. Uh, usually it's either under proc slash proc, and you'll find a file in there called config.gz, or they're in the boot directory, and the config will have the, uh, will have the uh, version number of the kernel. So you can match up that config file with the particular version that's running it currently on your system. If you don't find it, you're going to have to check with the distribution uh, people and their support people and see where you can locate it or go back to their documentation and see where they tell you to go find it. Ah, so, what do we do about bloatware? One of the things that, and I'm not recommending this for you, I'm just telling you what I do. If, if you want to try this and you like this and it works for you, great. If it doesn't, well, you know, uh, that your needs are a little different than mine. Um, I always start with, start with a server minimal version of any distribution. And that's because it's the smallest footprint of both the OS and the packages. And then I tailor it to what I need. Now, I can tell you that if you were to download Fedora's workstation and Fedora's server, you would find that there's a few differences between them. For one, the default server file system for the server is XFS, whereas the default uh, for Workstation is X4. So, um, of course, you can change those when, when you're building your system, but I'm just telling you those are the defaults. Uh, also on the firewall, um, the server will reject any TCP IP connection with the exception of SSH, DHCP, and uh, Cockpit, which is Cockpit is their a new way of being able to do system administration with a GUI. Also, uh, the server doesn't install a GUI at all. There is a selection that says server with GUI and that will uh, deploy GNOME and all of the GNOME packages uh, with the exception of the ones used to tweak it. Uh, and the default workstation, the firewall rejects any TCP IP connection below port 1024. With the, exception of S, with the exception of SSH, SAMBA, and DHCP. Uh, the ports above 1024 are open, so you'll just be aware of that. Uh, also, Workstation installs GNOME by default. So, I think probably the best thing to do is to uh, do a walkthrough of how to do a, a Linux compile and let you see what we're talking about with some of the feature sets and how to select them, how to turn them into modules, or how to just get rid of them. And I thought, I thought I would end with this. As, uh, I always got a laugh out of this when it was first released, this, the system development lifecycle diagram, where you start out with requirements, design, implementation, and test. Now, they added evolution to this, but it used to say run. And we always took that to mean when you're done testing, you run. I hope to see you again real soon. Thanks for uh, sticking around and listening this long. If you liked the video, please like and subscribe and see you all again next time. And bye for now.